Okay, well, good morning, everyone. It is 1103 and our, our practice is to give everyone three minutes to get in. So we're right on the button here. Welcome to Score Bucks County's webinar on creating an empowered home office. I think you're gonna find this fascinating and very timely for today's work environment. Um, my name's Linda Zangrilli. I'm the current chapter chair for Score Bucks County. So uh, I would like to start out with just a few housekeeping items. First of all, we are recording this. You will receive a copy of the recording as well as a copy of the slide. So you can rest easy and don't have to take furious notes during the presentation. Uh, secondly, please hold your questions until the end. And if you do have a question as we go along the way, put it in the Q&A, not the chat. That'll, that'll help us get everything answered at the end of the presentation. So if you will indulge me just for a moment, I'd like to talk a little bit about our SCORE Bucks County chapter and SCORE in general. Who we are, some of you may or may not be familiar with us. We are a national nonprofit organization. We have some 350 chapters all over the country between 10 and 13,000 people belong to this organization. And we have one very, very simple mission to help start small businesses and help them grow and flourish. That's it. That's a very, very simple mission that we all follow. And how we do that is through webinars like this Thanks to COVID-19, everything is free this year, so you can take advantage of that. We also do that through mentoring services. We have uh, in our Score Bucks County chapter that encompasses all of Bucks County as well as Eastern Montgomery County, we have 75 people who are classified in various ways. They're either mentors, who can work with you one-on-one -on -one and help you if you're trying to start your business or if you have a business that's maybe needing a little bit of a push, um, we can help you with that as well. Our members come from all walks of life. They have business backgrounds in just about every business discipline. So if we can't help you, I don't know who can. We, we also have this large organization behind us that allows us to call on other experts as we mentor you. So I hope that you enjoy today's seminar. If you'd like to become a client of ours or if you'd like to become a member of our chapter, everything is on our website at buckscounty.score.org. And if you go on there, you will find all the appropriate links to either become a client or a member. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to bring on the gentleman who organizes all of these events. His name is Ed Torello, and he is our chair for the webinar programs. Ed, you want to take it from here? Thank you very much, uh, Linda, and thank you all for joining us. I think this is going to be a very exciting uh, presentation. This is one of 34 that we've put together for our fiscal year, which is September to September. And next year, we have 40 of them set up already for our uh, September to September program. So hopefully within that whole framework, you ought to be able to find several of them that will really help you. Um, we put the, the, the uh, seminar uh, list out in advance so that you can click it into your device so that it can alert you when the particular webinar that we do uh, interests you. Today, we have um, Eileen Levitin, who is the founder and lead designer of um, uh, and a certified uh, aer aer aeronomic office um, environment. Uh, she is the lead designer for workspace home office designs. She is an interior designer with almost 20 years of experience helping clients design beautiful, functional, and, and healthful home workspace. I think most of you will, in some form, have a need of what she's talking about. And so that's, that's why we put this together so that people can uh, benefit from what she has to say. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eileen 
And remember, please put your questions in the Q&A. And at the end, I will ask um, Eileen the questions and she will hopefully answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Ed. Um, I wanna start today by telling you a story. It's a story of a woman named Blossom who I met 17 years ago when I was working for a large furniture store outside of Washington, DC. It was the end of a very busy Saturday and Blossom came into the showroom with her daughter. Um, Blossom was probably in her late seventies, I'm guessing. And her daughter was probably my age. Um, and the daughter looked extremely weary and Blossom looked royally pissed off. And when I approached them, the daughter kind of took me aside and she said, I need to buy a bed for my mother. Um, she lives in Florida, but we're moving her up here to assisted living and she doesn't want to come. She's fighting this tooth and nail and I need to get her a bed. So I said, okay. And I started to try to engage Blossom, uh, asking her questions about what she might like. And she would not look at me. She just had her arms folded and her head down and she scowled. And her daughter said she hates everything. We Four days, we've been looking all over DC and we haven't found anything. So I don't have high hopes for this, but good luck. So I just started taking them on a tour of the bedrooms in this 40,000 square foot showroom. And every time we'd stop by a bedroom, Blossom would say, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So finally, we got back to the starting place. We're back to where we started. And um, I said, I'm really sorry. I guess I just don't have what she's looking for. And the daughter said, exasperated, mother, you hate everything. What do you like? And the mom said, I like flowers. And the daughter looked at me and she goes, sorry, I'm so sorry. She likes flowers. I don't, you know. And I said, okay, just a minute, I have an idea. And I ran down to the fabric room. I grabbed a whole bunch of floral prints. I came back, I said, come with me. And I took her to an upholstered bed that could be customized. And I draped a print over the bed. And I said, I can do flowers for you. We can do flowers. And Blossom stared at it in a minute. And then she said, I like it. I like it. And at which point the daughter burst into tears and I got a little teary. And 20 minutes later, Blossom had a bed. So I'm telling you, you're probably wondering why are you telling me a story about beds when we're here to talk about home offices? Um, the reason is that that incident had a huge impact on me. It had a huge impact on me, lots of reasons, but a lot to do with um, why I do what I do. And it's because space matters. Our spaces matter. What we put in our spaces, how we feel in our spaces really makes a difference in our quality of life. And um, as business people working from home, I want you in the course of this uh, webinar to be thinking about the space where you're working and hopefully you'll get some tips today that can make it all that it can be. So moving along, just a quick bit about me. My name is Eileen Levitan. Quick tidbit, I was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. I have dual citizenship. That tells you more about my parents than it does about me, but it's just a fun fact. Um, I say I have been doing interior design for 18 years. The truth is I was probably born doing interior design. Um, from the time I picked up wooden blocks, I was building houses. And um, my hobbies were drawing floor plans, visiting model homes, and it's, it's been what I've done all my life. Um, however, when I went to college, I majored in English literature. I have a master's degree in creative writing. And um, uh, when you do those degrees, you also have to take up a trade because you can't really earn a living. So um, I ended up as a photography editor. In the first half of my career, I had a lot of fun working with photography. I stayed home to raise my family. And when it was time to go back to work, I wanted to go back into design. So I ended up in furniture sales and then really heavy design work in those positions. Um, last spring when the pandemic hit, 
I um, started seeing customers and clients who suddenly were working from home. Their kids were being schooled from home. Their college kids were home and their young adult kids were home and everybody's trying to work. And I had this idea that I could be helpful to people getting them set up in office spaces. Um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Work from home versus work in an office setting. Um, I used to work years ago when I was in publishing in a setup just like this. We called it Prairie Dog Village because when someone came in, a hundred heads would, would pop up. Um, this is standard issue. You know, when you work in a corporate setting, you get a desk, you get a chair and you fit yourself to it. Because most of us are business owners or working from home, we get to design this space to our needs for our happiness, our health and our productivity. And that's my goal for today is to help you um, get that space all it can be. A sex, sorry, a successful home office will enable concentration and minimize distractions, provide physical comfort, create a sense of effectiveness and well-being, and make you want to be there. So how do we minimize distractions? What challenges our ability to focus? This is probably gonna come as no surprise to most of you, but the number one challenge are interruptions by family. That's what most people cite as their biggest challenge. By that, they usually mean kids. A study by the Pew Research Center found that half of parents, both mothers and fathers, working with children younger than 18 while they're working from home, all or most of the time say it's difficult getting their work done without interruption. Only 20% of people working from home who don't have children under the age of 18 say the same thing. Clearly, there are distractions when we work from home, but I am sure many of you know who've worked in an office, you can get distracted in an office setting as well. Your boss comes in, your coworkers are chatty. Um, what we need to do is figure out how to minimize distractions wherever we are set up. Probably one of the most um, difficult and most psychological distractions is disorganization. It is overwhelming often. It can be depressing often. Um, according to an article in Forbes magazine, most people spend at least 30 minutes to an hour a day looking for things. I'm sure most of you can relate to that. I look for my glasses and my keys all the time. Um, that same article in Forbes also says that according to a survey of over a thousand workers by staffing firm ADECO, 57% of those workers admit that they judge their coworkers by how clean or dirty they keep their offices. And meanwhile, half of them say they have been appalled by how messy a colleague's office is, and most of the time they chalk it up to laziness. So if we think about that and relate it to ourselves and our businesses, we clearly do not want our clients thinking of us as lazy. We do not want them thinking of us as disorganized. Um, it also can decrease your morale, your engagement with your work, and it can harm client relations and even destroy your brand. Disorganization and um, clutter can be very overwhelming to the point where you get immobilized by it and you don't even know how to fix it anymore. If this is a distraction for you in your work, I strongly recommend hiring a home organizer. In one or two days, they can come in and get a place for everything and everything in its place. And you will be amazed at the freedom um, mentally that you feel when your office is, is organized. Um, it's, it's an amazing feeling. Other distractions when you're working from home, household chores calling your name. Pets. My little dog Sona is here at my feet right now. If she starts barking, we're going to see household distractions in real time. Hopefully she will stay quiet. Um, other, temper, uh, other distractions. Temperature. If you are too hot or too cold, you will not be able to pay attention to your work. Noise. Pesky distractions are social media, too many emails, too many phone calls. So how do we deal with these? 
the most important thing you can do is set boundaries. The clearer your boundaries are between your time, among your time and your space, between your personal life and your work life, the better you can keep those things distinct. For every person I speak to who tells me that their family is interrupting their work, I have other, another person who says, my work is interrupting my family life because I can't shut it off at the end of the day. You need to be able to set time limits. I work from nine to five, I work from 10 to six, or schedule your work day around your family's needs. But whatever those needs are, post them on your social media, on your website, and have your family also know, this is when I am working. Please don't interrupt unless the house is on fire or someone has to go to the hospital. Um, I know with kids that can be harder. Um, and I can talk to people about that also, but not in the context of this webinar. Um, other things that are helpful is to get noise canceling headphones, put up do not disturb signs. Um, I heard a story recently about a mom with young kids who bought a tiara and she said, I am the queen of this house. When I have my tiara on, you may approach and we can talk and play. And when the tiara is not on, the queen is working and cannot be disturbed. So a creative solution. The most important thing you can do beyond that is to have a designated space in your house where you work. Ideally, that space would be a room with a door. Unfortunately, not everyone has that extra room in their house to dedicate to their office. So what do we do? We have to get creative and start re-envisioning our space. Uh, in this photo, these folks have taken a storage room that has a door to the attic and they've turned it into quite a clever, cozy office space. Um, you also can look at corners in your rooms. A lot of times corners are not utilized and you could easily put a desk into a corner. Another elegant solution, convert a closet. Um, the thing I love about closet conversions is they have doors. So just like a private room, you close up the doors at the end of the day and you're done with work. Um, you have those doors closed and your company is none the wiser that you have a busy office tucked away there. And if you have clients who have confidential information, you can put a locks on those doors and keep everything safe. Similarly, you can repurpose an armoire or a cabinet. Um, these guys took a television armoire, they painted the interior uh, shelf up here, uh, put colorful fabric on the back and put bulletin boards on the doors and they made themselves a very um, cozy, friendly office space. Again, doors to close it up at the end of the day. People walking past who are visiting you just see a beautiful piece of furniture. And you can lock it up. You can tuck an office underneath a staircase. Some other ideas. Room dividers. I've used bookcases for people where I've divided the room with a bookcase. The back of the bookcase becomes a great place to put a bullet board. Um, you can use a folding screen as in this photo here. Um, if you just have a desk against the wall in your living room, you might wanna get a folding screen to put around you while you're working to um, get some privacy. People are using study carols, the kind you see in libraries. What you wanna do is start thinking outside the box. Any small space can do. You can put a desk in your living room. You can put a desk in your kitchen. You can work from the kitchen table. What you need to do though, is designate this as this is my workspace. So that psychologically, every time you're sitting down, you know I'm working. And when you get up, you're off the clock. If you set up your kitchen table, sit in the same chair every time when you've it's time to have dinner, you fold everything up, close up your laptop, put it in a box or a bin and put the bin away in the same place every day. It's about, it's about creating a habit. So a successful home office will also provide physical comfort. 
And this is where I'm going to get technical with you guys. This is where I'm going to put on an ergonomics consultant hat uh, because setting yourselves up physically is really important. You may have heard the word ergonomics. You may not know what it means. Um, Webster's Dictionary applies it as an applied science concerned with designing and arranging things people use so that the people and the things interact most efficiently and safely. Another way to think about it is you wanna fit the task to the worker, not the worker to the task. As you can see, and as you know, people come in different shapes and sizes. When you have a prairie dog village corporate setup where all the chairs are the same and all the desks are the same, some of those people are not gonna fit nicely in those spaces. So once again, when you're talking about ergonomics and your physical health, you have to be set up for your body. The reason for that is home offices um, tend to create musculoskeletal disorders. What are these? Musculoskeletal disorders affect the joints, the ligaments, the muscles, the nerves, and the tendons, and structures that support the limbs, neck, and back. They can arise from um, lifting something heavy, but they can also arise from repetitive, sorry, repetitive strain, repetitive motion, and from sitting in an awkward posture. A study done by health and safety consultants Aronite showed that in 2019, 1.4% of musculoskeletal cases were connected to work. In 2020, however, when everyone was sent home to work, that number rose to 37.7, huge increase. And you'll see if you are interested in Google this, that chiropractors and physical therapists all over are noticing huge upticks in physical problems related to their home, people's home office setups. Keyboard work was the third leading cause of these disorders. And that was behind heavy lifting and materials manipulation. In my opinion, from my research, I think this is due to laptops. Uh, people were sent home. Suddenly they brought their laptops home. They set up on their sofas, in their beds, on the floor, at their kitchen table or counter. And as we're gonna see shortly, I'm gonna get to this, laptops are a terrible, terrible um, way to be working ergonomically. You can't do it. So we don't wanna wait for pain to take this problem seriously. If you've never suffered from back, neck or shoulder pain, um, you don't really understand what it means. But musculoskeletal disorders can be seriously debilitating. Um, they can put you out of commission for weeks or months at a time and send you to physical therapists, chiropractors, and even orthopedic surgeons, and we don't want that. What you wanna do is be proactive and get yourself set up before you feel the pain. Once you feel pain, you know, you can be blissfully unaware that anything is happening to you. Once you start feeling the pain, you've actually started causing damage. So again, you wanna be proactive. I'm gonna show you a study that was done in 2014 um, with cell phones. When you are sitting upright and your head is balanced on your neck and your shoulders, your head weighs 10 to 12 pounds. That's called a neutral position. But as soon as you tilt your head, you flex your head forward 15 degrees, the pressure on the back of your neck and your shoulders goes up to 27 pounds. When you bend your head 30 degrees, it goes up to 40 pounds. 45 degrees, you're almost at 50 pounds of pressure on the back of your neck and shoulders. And at 60 degrees, you're up to 60 pounds. So you can imagine if you're working for hours and hours and hours a day, at a, working on a cell phone or more likely an iPad or a laptop, you're really putting a lot of pressure on the back of your neck and shoulders. The other thing to think about with this is when you are in a hunched over position and the smaller the device you're working on, the more hunched you are, um, it can affect how people see you. It's body posture, right? So if you're hunched over, 
you're, you look sad, maybe you look depressed, you might look scared. Um, it's not a posture that promotes confidence in others, by others. Um, the best, best TED talk I've ever seen on this topic was done by Dr. Amy Cuddy in 2012. I watched it again recently. She's got over 62 million viewers of this. Um, it's about body language and how not only that your body language affects how others see you, but she did scientific study that it can actually change your sense of powerfulness. She researched body posture and the effects on our hormones, in particular testosterone and cortisol. And what she found was that the way we hold our bodies, our posture actually affects our sense of um, strength and powerfulness and confidence, and it reduces our stress levels. So very great talk, um, urge you all to watch it if you're interested. So to get you set up in the right posture at your workstation, we need to look at a bunch of things. I'm gonna talk to you today about your desk, your monitor, and your keyboard and mouse. The standard desk is 29 to 30 inches high. It never occurred to me to wonder why the standard desk is 29 to 30 inches high, but you might be surprised to learn it has nothing to do with the human body. Someone somewhere took two filing cabinets, put a board across the top and said, oh, now we have a desk that we can mass produce. But if you think back to one size does not fit all, you will be surprised to learn that a 29 to 30 inch desk is meant for a male who is six foot four. And that is 2% of the population. So 98% of people cannot fit properly at the standard size of your desk. So what do we do about that? The answer lies in your desk chair. What you need is an adjustable desk chair. You need to be able to adjust the height of the seat, the seat depth, your lumbar support, your armrest should be able to go up and down and the back should be able to tilt easily. I cannot overstate the importance of a good desk chair. Um, you can buy a desk chair like this that will at least adjust your height and your lumbar probably um, at an office store um, for probably $1.99. It is not gonna last you as long as a desk chair that costs more. Uh, over time, like within a year, the arms are gonna rattle, the seat is gonna probably be compressed and you probably will have to get a new one. So that is to say, ergonomic chairs do cost money it's worth the investment if you can afford it, if you can at all do it. If you can't, there are hacks for chairs and I can talk to you about that privately. Um, but this is what I would recommend to get ergonomically set up in your home office. So when you have your ergonomic chair, you want to raise the level of that chair so that your elbows are at the level of your desk. And I can imagine you all right now are looking at your elbows and seeing if they're at your desk top. Most of you probably can't do that because again, you've got to be a tall guy to make that happen. Um, so what happens if, you, if you're short, if you're, especially if you're a petite woman? Your legs are going to dangle. You're going to raise the seat and your legs are going to dangle. This is not healthy because you are going to end up with compression behind your knees here and lose circulation to your legs and your feet. Um, what you want to do, if this is the case for you, is get a footrest. You can buy an ergonomic footrest, but you don't have to. You can get a simple footstool. You can even put books or reams of paper, a box. Whatever you need to get a flat, steady surface beneath your feet is what you want. So once you've got that in place, you want to correct your posture. We call this the 90 angle, 90 degree angle rule. And I'll start at the top 
you want your eyes, and I'm going to show you this more when we get to monitors, but you want your eyes at the level of the top of your monitor. And then you want your neck, remember back to the skeleton, right? Neck straight, not ever flexing, but straight, up and down and relaxed on your shoulders. Um, so here we have straight neck. And then we want your arms from your elbows to your wrist, to your fingertips in a straight line. So no bend at the wrists whatsoever, straight line. And then we want a 90 degree angle at the elbow, the hips, the knees, and the ankles. So straight up and down here and here and everything else at 90 degrees. It's probably gonna surprise you, it surprised me to learn that we sit an average of 64 hours a week. That is two and a half days a week on our bottoms. If you think about that, just one hour of sitting causes our fat burning enzymes to drop 90%. So right off the bat, this is a problem for weight gain. According to a 2009 Mayo Clinic study, it's actually possible to burn an additional 340 calories a day by standing for two hours more or sitting two hours less, I should say. Prolonged sitting causes problems. It increases the discs, uh, the pressure on your spinal discs. They can actually um, lead to premature degeneration again, causes you to gain weight, it lowers your metabolism, also lowers levels of good cholesterol, and it slows down your circulation, which um, can lead to fatigue. So prolonged sitting, bad. Also prolonged standing is bad um, for you as well. It can cause varicose veins, it can cause pooling of blood in the lower legs and extremities and problems with your joints and your feet. So what do we do? Movement, movement is key. And it's more movement than you might think. Uh, there is something called the 28-2 rule. For every 30 minutes you're sitting, sorry, for every 30 minutes, you want to be sitting for 20 of those, standing for eight and moving for two. So twice an hour, you should be switching it up every 30 minutes, sitting for 20, standing for eight, and moving for two, much more than I thought when I first heard this. How do we get more movement in our day? One of the best things you can do is not make your life quite so convenient. Build inefficiencies into your day. So for instance, I used to think it was so smart and clever to have a big pitcher of water on my desk because I wanted to drink more water. I thought I'll finish this pitcher. By the end of the day, I've had my eight glasses. Much better idea, and what I've implemented is put that pitcher in my kitchen in the refrigerator and get up and go get myself a glass of water. Um, the other thing you might do is anytime the phone rings, stand up and talk on the phone. Set a timer if you wanna remind yourself to stand. A big one is when you're setting up your home office, don't put your printer near your desk. Put it in another room if possible, or at least on the other side of the room. So anytime you wanna print, you have to stand up and walk. The key is make your life so that you are standing up and walking, get up and play with your pet, you know, look out the window. This is a solution that many, many people are opting for right now. I'm getting many clients uh, interested in standing desks. There are different kinds of standing desks. They all operate uh, different different ways. And I am happy to talk to you about the different kinds, but just know that this is a very efficient, effective way to get your standing and sitting in. If you already have a desk or you don't want to spend the money for a standing desk, they also sell something called a desk, a standing desk converter. There are different kinds of these as well. Some are easier and harder to operate, um, but it is another way that you could get sitting and standing in. your monitor. As I said before, you want to get the top of the monitor at eye level 
or slightly below eye level. You may need to adjust this. Sometimes monitors come on adjustable stands. You just want to raise it up so that your eyes are at the top of it. Um, if your monitor is too low and it's not adjustable, you can buy, a, buy an adjustable stand, but you also can put it on books, a box, a step stool, whatever, whatever you need, reams of paperwork as well. Once your monitor is up at eye level height, you actually want to push it away from you so that it is away at arm's length, about 20 inches or so. If you have a big monitor, like I do, I have a 27 inch, actually has to be a little bit farther away. Same thing goes if you have dual monitors, they need to be set up farther away. Your eyes should, you never wanna be flexing your head, as I said before, you wanna be looking straight ahead. I mean, your, eye, your head should be straight and just your eyes looking down toward the middle of the monitor, middle of the screen. And then to get better eyesight, you might wanna tilt your monitor back 10 to 20 degrees. If you wear bifocals or progressives, which I do, um, that's a whole different ball game because you, when your head is straight, you need to be looking through the bottoms of your glasses. So in that case, your monitor stays at desk level. Your keyboard. What you wanna do here is bring your keyboard as close to the front of your desk as you can. Um, you never wanna be resting your wrists on the edge of your desk or on the flat surface of your desk. That can lead to carpal tunnel. Only this thick part of your palm, the meaty part of your palm should be touching your desk. So bring the keyboard close to your lap as possible. Then you wanna keep your keyboard flat. What you're looking at in this illustration is an iMac and an iMac keyboard, which I used to use. Um, it is a completely flat keyboard. The problem with that keyboard, which I used for a long time, is it's really, really narrow. You want your keyboard to be about as wide as your shoulders. Because when you're using it, you want to keep your arms off your armrests and relaxed at your side. And your fingers should just be straight ahead working on your keyboard. If your shoulders are hunched, like mine were, trying to work on this little iPad, iMac um, keyboard, you're gonna cause problems in your, in your back and your shoulders, which I actually had. Um, the other thing is, if you have armrests on your chair, you don't wanna use them when you're working. They're called armrests for a reason because they're meant to be used while you're resting. So your mouse. The mouse that I've been using, again, it came with my, my uh, iMac is flat. Probably a lot of you are using a similar mouse, flat mouse. When you use this mouse, your hand is flat and it's facing the desktop, your palm is down. Correct ergonomic posture when using a mouse is actually the way you would shake someone's hand. It should be at about 57 degrees. So if you put your hand out right now, try this, put your hand out like you're gonna shake someone's hand. Now turn it over like you're putting it on your desktop. It's a very subtle feeling, but you can actually feel the muscles in your forearm working. What you want when you're ergonomically set up is to be in a neutral, they call it a neutral posture, using your muscles as little as possible. So if you're mousing all day with your arm turned over, they call that over pronation, you're gonna start feeling it in your arm, maybe in your hand even. Um, with a really small mouse, you're squeezing that mouse to grip it and you're causing problems uh, between your finger and your thumb. So handshake position best. Um, the problem with a vertical mouse is you have to have one for your left hand or your right hand. They, they don't do ambidextrous mice. Um, and it's always recommended to be able to switch hands when you're mousing. So you may end up wanting to have one for each hand. Um, I just have a vertical mouse that I use in my right hand, even though I'm left-handed and it works for me. Sometimes they have to be sized as well to fit your hand. So big question, what do we do about laptops? So many people are working from them. 
I've got bad news about laptops. I kind of mentioned this earlier. You can never get correct ergonomic posture from a laptop alone. The reason for this is to get ergonomic posture, right? Your, your eyes are up here, your hands are at the desktop. You have to be able to separate your hands from your eyes and you can't do that on a laptop. They're linked. What you're gonna need if you're working from a laptop is first of all, to put yourself on a hard surface, so a desk or a table. And then you're gonna need a riser of some kind. They're also called kickstands. Once you've got your laptop up on a riser, you can no longer use the keyboard. So you're gonna need a wireless keyboard and mouse. I switched that kind of fast. You might wanna look at that a little longer. Um, again, you can't use it because your keys are gonna be up high. Your keyboard and mouse need to be on the desktop. And just quickly, I'll talk to you about your phone. Crunching your phone, crunching your phone between your neck and your shoulder is always gonna cause you problems. It's gonna give you neck problems. If you are using your phone a lot during the day, it's best to invest in a telephone headset. Now we're gonna talk about your lighting. Natural lighting is always best. According to an article in the Harvard Business Review, they did a poll of 1,614 North American employees and found that access to natural light and the view of the out of doors was their number one uh, priority. And that outranked cafeterias on site, fitness centers on site, and even childcare on site. Everyone wanted natural light. It just increases your mood. Uh, there's a 51% drop in the incidence of eye strain, 63% drop in the incidence of headaches, 56% reduction in drowsiness. So if you are setting up a new home office and you can locate near a window, that is ideal. As everyone I'm sure is aware, staring at a computer screen all day is, uh, is problematic. It can give you eye strain, it can give you headaches. There is something called the 20-20-20 rule, which means every 20 minutes, you wanna look away at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Now, maybe you wanna link this to your 2082 rule where you're getting up and leaving your desk. Go look out a window for 20 minutes, 20 seconds, not 20 minutes. Um, it will help your eyes to refocus them. So a successful home office will also create a sense of effectiveness and well-being and make you want to be there. One of the most important things, factors, is the use of color. Color can greatly affect our mood. There was a study done way back in, 20, or in 1974 that showed that not only does color affect our moods, but it can influence how others respond to us, and it can change our heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration. If you, I, I always ask my clients, how do you want to feel in your space? If you want to feel reflective, thoughtful, um, calm, you might want to go with cool colors like blues and greens and purples. If you want to feel lively and energized and excited, you might want to go with the warm colors of orange and red. Here are two examples, a cool toned office and a warm office. Just some eye candy for you. You can keep things neutral by going with grays or beiges. Uh, this is a very sophisticated, calm space. Or you can do a neutral room. This is a black and white room. And they just popped some color on the desktop and popped an orange light. And you get the same exciting, um, stimulating color, but without a commitment to a whole wall or a whole room of orange. And if you change, you want to change your look in a year from now, you're just changing some accessories. Aesthetics and personalization. This is where you're making your space your own. I think this is where a lot of people stop short and 
get their home office up and running and say, okay, it's fine. It's fine. I can work in this done. But when you personalize your home office and you make it your own, you make it a lot more fun to be there. You make it happy and yours. You can do this with a lot of things. You can add texture, put a few plants around, put some, I had a coworker who never missed a day without live, uh, sorry, without cut flowers on her desk because they made her happy. Um, you can put up colorful wallpaper, for instance, as in this uh, illustration. Rugs are a whole other thing and they're more than just decorative. Rugs can actually define a space. So say your home office is set up in your living room. You can put a rug in the living area and another rug in the office area and you've defined your space that way. Rugs also add, um, my dog is whimpering in her sleep. <laughs> you can also add um, warmth to the room. You can block noise with a rug, block sound. And then put up personal art and photographs. Anything that pleases you uh, will make you happier in your space. So again, you want your space to represent you because your clients are gonna see this space either on Zoom or in person. And you want it to reflect you well, you want it to be clean, you want it to be organized and you want it to be you. Takeaways from today, designate a space wherever that is in your house, think creatively and make it where you work. Set some boundaries around your time in your space. Prioritize your desk chair. If I only had one thing to tell you today that you took with you, that would be it. Your desk chair is gonna be your best friend. It's gonna be your worst enemy. And um, don't scrimp on it, invest. Likewise, move and move a lot. Move more than you think you need to. Get up 20 minutes, sit for 20, get up for eight and move for two. And then make your space personal and appealing. Feeling happier and healthier and more productive at work can affect your bottom line. But it can also make you more present and more effective in other areas of your life. Here's how workspace home office designs can help you. We can help you design an office setup in any room in your house, um, help you actually locate that space and then help you design it. Um, we do floor planning, can make a space more efficient. We can help you figure out furniture, writing, logs and rugs and accessories. Um, we do basic ergonomic evaluations and recommendations, window treatment design, and all of this can be done um, in your home or from the comfort of your Zoom. Um, so we're gonna be sending you all the links. There's my, there's my website. I do free 20 minute consultations. If you wanna give me a call, there's my phone number and you will be getting a copy of this slide deck. So you'll have every way you can to reach me. Um, would be very happy to help. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you all so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. And if I can answer any questions, I would love to. Great. Well, thank you so much, Eileen. That was very, very good. I learned quite a bit myself. Unfortunately, I have okay. not following any of the rules you put up, but I might actually try to do that in the future. A couple of questions have come in right away. What chair would you actually recommend? Oh. Um, you know, if you go to Staples or you go to those places, they got 27 different ergonomic chairs and, you know, they immediately show you the most expensive. But uh, what, what, what do you find is, is the chair of choice? Yeah, that's a really good question. And unfortunately, it's not an easy answer because every chair has to fit your body. So what I would say is try them on, sit in them move them, figure out how you move the seat up and down so your feet are flat on the floor. Um, like I said, you want it to be adjustable uh, in the seat height and the lumbar. If you only, and I'm not sure how many adjustable chair, how adjustable chairs at a store, in an office store, how adjustable they'll be. 
Um, but at least your lumbar and your height uh, in a store like that. But up, uh, you know, beyond that, um, a mesh chair is going to allow your seat to breathe as opposed to a leather chair where you might actually feel warm sitting in it uh, if you sat in it for a long period of time. But it really is such a personal choice. Um, I would go and try them on mm -hmm. and ask lots of questions. Here's a question actually for me. Um, I, how about food in the room? Now, should I have a little refrigerator here, for example, or should I use what you said before, which is get up, walk over to the refrigerator, get something and bring it back? Well, um, I mean, I guess if your little yeah. refrigerator is across the room and you have to stand up to get it, that's fine. Um, but ideally, especially if your kitchen's downstairs, it might be good to run up and down the stairs to get your snacks. Um, I thought you were gonna talk about crumbs. No, no, I was just talking about the rest of the uh, product, <laughs> excluding the crumbs, that's what's left. Also, yeah. I, I wasn't going to ask her, but I guess when it gets to five o'clock, do you have a rule about, uh, I'm being facetious here, you remember the song, it's five o'clock somewhere, a cocktail hour. I didn't oh. hear you from that. I uh, highly recommend a cocktail hour. <laughs> ah, okay, good. I'll put that on my list. Uh, okay. Even if it, you know, a diet coke. <laughs> and another question that people are interested in. So you post a schedule to keep the children out. The door can't read as it. As best so you can, as best you can. Yeah. How do you, what do you put on there? Mommy is available. If they're little, what, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's not easy. Well, I, I mean, it's not easy with little ones and you're, you got to roll with the punches with little ones. I mean, you got to be flexible. Um, you do the best you can. And you, like I said, there was that one mom with the tiara. Um, like I think you could, I mean, if it were me doing this right now, I probably would get a flag and say, <laughs> when the flag is flying, I'm working. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, small children demand attention and you just have to, you kind of have to go with it. But like I said before, if you're in, a, in an office setting, I worked for 11 months next to a woman who did not stop talking literally for one minute. She had some mm -hmm. kind of issue. And most of the time it was to me, even when I was <laughs> trying to add numbers and no matter what I did, she didn't stop talking. So there are distractions no matter where you work and you have to learn to, right. you have to learn. Well, I guess that canceling noise headset thing you talked about is probably the answer for that woman. Right. Um, are standing desks setups a good idea? You did cover that, but- um, Yes, I, I think they are a very good idea. Um, there are three kinds. There's a crank standing desk that takes, can take a lot of arm strength to, you know, to maneuver and they're slow, but they're inexpensive. I mean, all of them have their pros and cons, right? There are electric standing desks that you can actually pre-program. So you just hit a button and it goes to your standing height and you hit another button and it um, lowers to your standing height. Um, they can be slow and they can be noisy. So pros and cons. Then there's something called a um, counterbalance desk where you're, you're kind of squeezing something and raising and lower it. Those are the fastest and the quietest. I think they may be the most expensive um, but I think in general, it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, you might want to have a mat on your floor to make your floor better for standing, for a standing posture. Um, the other thing I neglected to mention about desk chairs is when you have an adjustable desk chair, they're really best for one person. You can imagine, right? If you have to get your chair set up for you and then your wife comes in and redoes it it's mm -hmm. kind of like your buttons on your radio in the car only maybe even worse right you then you have to redo it and you have to redo it so it's really best um either for everyone to have their own chair or um there are certain kinds of chairs that require less adjusting that i didn't get into today that i could talk to you about somebody's interested this is uh, i think kind of an interesting health question in a way how do you find desks and office furniture that isn't from China or made from cancer-causing chemicals, but is still affordable? 
Uh, ooh, challenging. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, it says it's cancer causing. So. I'm yeah, gonna... yeah. I mean, there are um, regulations in the industry. California standards are the strictest. So I would look for something that was that met California standards. Um, and you can ask when you're buying the furniture, does this meet California regulations? Um, mm -hmm. In terms of China, yeah, you would have to ask the manufacturer or the who, whoever you're buying it from where it's made. Um, there are companies that specifically work with American made product that I could talk to you about. Um, you also could set up your own. You could get some filing cabinets and buy a beautiful piece of wood or a beautiful piece of granite and build yourself your own. Okay. So here's something, looking for ideas for Zoom backgrounds. Virtual backgrounds can be distracting. And she's also looking at a privacy screen. Are there other thoughts that you would have in the back? Yeah, Zoom backgrounds, um, I totally get it with them. I struggle to, I, I get distracted when people use that because your head goes kind of wonky. And if you move, you, you start seeing through the Zoom. Um, they sell green screens that you actually can attach to the back of your chair that will put a green screen behind you. And then you can um, use the Zoom pictures or there's places like something called Canva where you can get um, backgrounds. You can get them online, right. but you need a green screen to get rid of that wonkiness. And then what uh, was the other part of that question? Oh, um, screens, screens, yeah. You can, you can certainly put a screen behind you. I mean, that's probably what I'm gonna do at some point. You're, you're seeing my living room right now, but I probably at some point will get a screen to block that off. One that's interesting on, I think more like placing furniture and then stuff to go in the, the office. So they've got their desk that's facing their living room, uh, the wall in their living room, but they can also see the window from the desk. Mm -hmm. And okay, so that's positioning of the desk. And then they want to put a shelf on the wall above the desk. Is that okay? Sure. And last, do you recommend a calendar whiteboard or a desk calendar? Do I recommend, I couldn't hear that part. Do I recommend what? A, um, a whiteboard or a desk calendar? Oh gosh, that is such a personal, it depends what you need it for and your personal preference. Like my calendar is a book. I, I use a book. Um, when I worked in an office, my blotter was a calendar. A lot of people prefer their calendar on their computer. It's such a personal preference. A whiteboard is great because you just erase, but I don't, I don't, I would want to talk to you, you know, and figure out what your needs are and then help recommend something. Somebody was interested also in, for organizational purposes, how do you keep little notes? You know, people put stickies all over the place and after a while yeah. it looks like a jungle. But, That's true. Uh, <laughs> you use a whiteboard and kind of put them in a row or- what, Well, what, that what? would certainly keep them neater. Um, yeah. I'm a big proponent of sticky notes because my SCORE mentor, Kathleen Donahue, <laughs> Uh, who I love and thank um, is, you know, taught me about the power of the sticky notes. So I am about sticky notes and I have them all over my living room wall sometimes. But if you don't like that craziness, um, there are apps you can get on your phone that are notepad apps or um, I email myself sometimes when I have to remember something. I use my desktop um, kind of like a crazy person with, <laughs> I have stuff all over my desktop, but I personally like my, I like my office neat and tidy. I like things put, having a place for everything and everything in their place. So if too many sticky notes are going to make you cuckoo, I would, I would figure out another solution. And that's certainly something we could talk about. So I saw the picture you showed about um, some desks are basically two sets of file cabinets and a top. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say I didn't use that, but I used a desk. I bought a desk similar to one of the ones in the picture. And I still need filing cabinet space and all of that. And I have a confined area. What do I do? I mean, should I get something upright that's behind the desk that kind of goes up into the 
Uh, you know, without that. seeing your space, is this you, Ed, or is this someone who asked? No, no, something I made up. Something uh, made, okay. Um, yeah, without seeing the space, that's hard to say because there are ways to effectively move furniture around to create space. Um, probably I would go vertically if space is at a minimum, get a filing cabinet that goes high, but not too high if you're petite because then you won't see in the top. <laughs> It really varies depending on person from person to person. I ask that because if you're using a, conf a small space and you're working, you've got no matter how much you want to say no, you always have paperwork. And you always have things that have to be checked back and forth. And so yeah. people have asked me that question. I mean, probably what I would do is um, get my oldest files and files I don't need to access anymore and box them up and put them somewhere else. And just keep my active files, you know, as a way to pare it down, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I think we have run out of questions, which is good. And we're pretty much at our appointed time. So I want to say thank you so much. Did a very good job. Very interesting. I learned a few things. Hopefully, Charlie did too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I learned why my back hurts. Yeah, yeah, right. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to turn it back to Linda, who will wrap things up. Linda? Thanks, I, I am so impressed with what you delivered today, Eileen. And for those of you who may not know, she just mentioned it. She is actual score client of Kathleen Donahue's. And how long have you been a client? You know, I was trying to figure that out. I think seven months, but I'm not yeah. So people come to us. Um, they have the skills. They, as Eileen has demonstrated, she had the knowledge, she had the skills, and but she didn't, I guess, have the confidence and maybe the clear path to where she wanted to go. But as you can see from this presentation, she's gotten there and she's gotten her successful business off the ground. So uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to hear your presentation. Very impressive. Thanks, Kathleen, for your guidance with this. And uh, for any of you out there who are struggling with uh, your business, please contact us. We're here to help. And hopefully we'll see one of you do a presentation in your specific area in the future. So thanks again to everyone, and we'll see you next time. Yes. Take care. <laughs>